Hi, everyone. My name is Jesus Lopez. I am the executive director at the New York State Youth Justice Institute. Welcome to the last Lunch and Learn webinar for 2023. And thank you so much for joining us today and throughout the year. We hope to have you again in 2024. To break the ice, feel free to drop in the chat what's at the top of your wish list for youth this coming year. My wish for all of us, for our young people, their families and communities is peace. I want to offer a well-deserved shout out to the YJI team for working hard this past year, for going above and beyond, for taking care of each other, and for having my back always. What a pleasure it is to lead a team like this. Thanks also to our partners in New York State, the CJS, OCFS, the Juvenile Justice Advisory Group and the University at Albany. Without their support, we wouldn't be here. It is my pleasure to be the very first to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Natasha Slesnik. Dr. Slesnik, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to your talk. Avery Irons, who is our Associate for TA and Training here at the YJI, will facilitate the conversation today. With that, Avery. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jesa. And thank you on behalf of the YJI team for your leadership this year. Uh, so hello, everyone, and welcome to the YJI's Lunch and Learn webinar series. My name is Avery Irons, and I'm the Associate for Training and Technical Assistance at the YJI. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Natasha Slesnik. She is the EHE Distinguished Professor of Human Development and Family Science in the Department of Human Sciences at The Ohio State University, and she's also the Associate Dean for Research. She's a licensed clinical psychologist, and her research focuses on substance use, mental health prevention, development, and evaluation with youth and families experiencing homelessness. In addition to consulting with organizations and policy groups on the best strategies for engaging youth and preventing continued homelessness and its consequences, she has founded two community-based drop-in centers for youth experiencing homelessness, one in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and one in Columbus, Ohio. We are excited for her to lead today's discussion on Housing First as Behavioral Health Prevention for Youth. And without further ado, Dr. Slesnick, thank you. Well, wonderful. Thank you for um, inviting me to present to you today. I'm I'm really excited about, about this opportunity to share the work that um, myself and my team have been doing with youth experiencing homelessness. Let me get my slides up. Okay. All right. So, um, Today, I'm going to be talking to you about one of the projects that my team and I have been working on since 2019. Um, this project is an opioid prevention project that works with youth 18 to 24 years experiencing homelessness who are at risk for opioid use. And our prevention intervention is a housing and a wraparound supportive services intervention. This is part of the HEAL initiative, the Helping End Addiction Long-Term um, um, Funding Stream. So this particular project is part of a cooperative and it's a two-part project. So the first part was a pilot study and the second part is a, is a larger randomized controlled trial. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you the first part of our study, that pilot study, because we have the data already and it allows me an opportunity to share with you the intervention that we test that we're testing with the youth um, and to show you our preliminary findings through that pilot. This is our team. Um, I'm PI of the project along with Dr. Kelly Kelleher, who's a pediatrician at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And you can see by the co-investigative team that it's a multidisciplinary group, which um, I believe is essential if we're going to really address the issues associated with homelessness amongst youth, because these youth's struggles um, uh, cross many disciplines. I mean, it crosses medicine, social work, psychology, nursing, <laughs> economics, health services, law, uh, and we're going to need all of these great minds together to be able to make a dent in, um, in improving the lives of these youth. 
Before I even get into our study, though, I want to talk to you a little bit about who these kids are that we're, that we're focusing our intervention on. So um, in first of all, the youth in Ohio, Ohio has the highest national overdose death rate uh, from opioids. It's 85% higher than the rest of the country. And leaders of the National Institute on Drug Abuse has, has said that this rapid increase in opioid use amongst youth is one of the most alarming drug abuse trends. Specifically in our work in Columbus, Ohio, we've found that 50% of youth report opioid and IV drug use. Uh, other studies similarly report high rates of opioid use and IV drug use with 79% of samples um, reporting, reporting this use. And we believe that this indicates that opioid epidemic has long disproportionately affected youth experiencing homelessness. Youth experiencing homelessness overall have much higher rates of substance use and physical and mental health problems. When these youth go to the streets, they're 12 times more likely to die than youth that are housed. Um, suicide is the primary cause of death for boys and drug overdose uh, for girls. Uh, reports indicate that only 10% of the youth that we serve access services meant for them. And we see that 45% of youth um, have been involved with the juvenile justice system or criminal justice system, and 30% have been a ward of the state. And that's in our sample. Um, I've, I've worked with um, other groups where, this, where these rates are, are even higher. We see significant racial disparities amongst youth experiencing homelessness. While black persons make up 13% of the overall population, they make up 40% of the homeless population. A black youth has 83% higher chance of reporting homelessness than their white peers. And studies have shown that being black is associated with a lower likelihood of finding permanent housing with white families 1.9 times more likely to to get housed than black families. Similarly, we see disparities with sexual and gender minorities. Even though only 7% of the population of adults um, report being a sexual gender minority and 20% um, of 18 to 24 year olds, 40% of samples across the country of youth experiencing homelessness identify as a sexual gender minority and these youth report even higher rates of substance use, HIV risk, victimization, suicide, and depression than even other youth experiencing homelessness. Um, dissatisfaction with services is also much higher amongst these youth, uh, which we believe to be associated with the experience of heterosexism. So why are we doing this study? Well, I've shown you that these youth are are very much at risk. We believe they're bearing the highest burden of the opioid epidemic. And also homelessness amongst youth is not rare. It used to be the case people didn't recognize these youth as a, as a specific large subgroup of those experiencing homelessness. But now we're getting better counts. They're still not great. But the estimates are that two to 5 million youth ex experience homelessness in the US each year. We don't have a lot of interventions empirically based interventions for these youth um, and even fewer prevention interventions. Uh, while shelters are typically the front door or the first contact for youth to uh, get connected into services, most youth under age 24 don't access the shelter system. S studies report only about a third report having ever accessed a shelter. So, we believe that we, in order to prevent opioid use disorder, that we need to get these kids off the streets. Um, we need to get the kids housed. And once they're housed, this is going to reduce stress and risk. And they're going to be able to focus on, on higher order needs rather than basic survival. 
Now, housing first is the name given to the philosophical approach that housing is a basic human right. Um, we believe that housing should come before or concurrent to substance use and mental health treatment because it's going to make those interventions more effective. Once you're able to stop worrying about where you're going to eat, um, how you're going to stay safe that night, where you're going to sleep, well, then we can start focusing on coping with some of the traumas and 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 coping with with some of the the, the life situations that these kids have had to deal with. Um, I wanted to um, bring up our first polling question now. And that question is, do you believe that housing should come first, even before substance use or mental health treatment for youth living on the streets? Okay, so it looks like we have our results. 91% of you have identified housing first as your primary choice of, of, of housing for youth. Um, now 10% didn't. And so some of the thoughts on that is that the, the continuum of has traditionally focused on um, helping youth uh, get stabilized prior to offering housing. The thinking being that if, if youth are able to show abs a period of abstinence, they can stabilize mental health, show that they can get in school or get a job and keep that job, then they're more likely uh, to keep their housing. So this has been the philosophy behind the treatment first rather than the housing first approaches. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. There we go. Okay. Now there has been some research to suggest that housing is a good prevention for drug use. Um, in, in particular, the odds of recent heart drug use amongst um, HIV positive adults experiencing homelessness were found to be four times higher when they remain homeless. So those who obtain housing were half as likely to use hard drugs and needles, to share needles, and to engage in unprotected sex. So we're seeing that housing does serve some prevention function. Now I mentioned prior prevention work, prior housing interventions, traditional housing services often uh, require that youth or adults with mental disorders or, or drug use demonstrate a period of sustained absence before receiving that supportive housing. Um, now this is a barrier sometimes for those with significant um, drug use problems because um, many of the people, adults, I'm thinking more older homeless adults, have a difficult time maintaining sustained abstinence. And so these become the chronically homeless who are cycling in and out of the shelters. Um, so the Housing First was actually um, developed by Samson Barris in New York City um, to address just those adults um, with serious mental health problems and substance use. Now, another prior prevention focus has been on those interventions delivered in the home and school settings, but with youth living on the streets, they're not able to access those interventions. So they're not as, um, they're not reaching them. Now, when working with youth, um, some things that should be considered is that you know, oftentimes services are available, especially in the large cities for youth, they don't access them. I mentioned this earlier, only only 10%, we think, of youth experiencing homeless access those services. These, these 
often betrayed by the system and its representatives. Those who are under 18 often avoid the shelters and other programs for youth because they're worried about being returned back home or going to the foster care system. Those over 18 often worry about the older adults who experience homelessness preying upon them. And they also talk about being overwhelmed by paperwork and not you know, not knowing how things work and that being that being um, scary for them. So we believe that active outreach, meeting youth where they're at, trying to, the, these youth who are trying to live day to day are, are unlikely to take advantage of prevention services. So we're gonna go out and find them. So I'm gonna talk now a little bit about our intervention. If, one of the primary components of our intervention is the strengths-based outreach and advocacy intervention. Okay, so we're going out and we're finding kids and we're asking them to engage with us. We can use paraprofessional staff. We focus on their strengths rather than their deficits. What are they bringing to the table? And we allow the client to identify what they want to work on, whereas we don't have an agenda. Uh, so we're trying to engage the youth. We're trying to overcome those barriers and past experiences that the kids have had with other people that prevent them from engaging. Now, the kids that we're dealing with, that we're working with, they don't, they don't have a lot of motivation for um, substance use treatment. They're not asking us for substance use treatment. In fact, they're not asking us for anything because we're going to them and we're talking to them and we're, we're basically pulling them into our intervention. Motivational interviewing is a strategy to work with youth to move them through the stages of change from pre-contemplation to contemplation to action. So they may start to, to start taking steps towards reducing substance use and, and reaching other goals that they have that they may not have had much motivation to address, mostly because of the circumstances that they've had to contend with. MI is short, it's only one to two sessions. So it doesn't demand a lot of the population. It has been shown um, to be pretty effective, even with youth experiencing homelessness. So altogether, this is our intervention. We're providing housing first. Uh, we're using the housing first philosophy. We're providing housing for six months and we provide utilities, but we're also providing six months of outreach and advocacy where we're working with youth on the streets. We're going to them. We do two MI sessions, two HIV prevention sessions. These kids are at high risk of HIV. Uh, also, for kids who express suicidal ideation, we offer 10 sessions of cognitive therapy for suicide prevention. Uh, and um, I'm just going to do the, the next polling question now. I just want to ask you, um, what proportion, like up to what proportion of youth have some studies found report ever having attempted suicide? Okay, so this is a pretty good, pretty good estimates here. So I see 58 um, estimated 35% and 31 estimated 68%. It's actually 68%. So recent studies, multiple studies have identified that youth report, 68% of youth in multiple samples have reported attempting suicide at least once in their lifetime. This is a huge number um, for um, those youth similar aged who are housed, it's 9%. So these youth are at extremely high risk for suicide. And this is why we are including suicide prevention in our intervention. And the suicide prevention that we use, um, we actually focus on the actual suicidal behaviors um, versus many Many interventions might focus on depression 
or or some other underlying mental health condition, but we focus specifically on the suicidal behaviors and coping with when the youth is starting to feel suicidal. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next slide. So our youth in our study, they had to be 18 to 24 years old, they had to experience homelessness, and they couldn't meet DSM-5 criteria for opioid use disorder. And that's because we're trying to prevent opioid use disorder. This is what our pilot study data looked like. So I'm, I'm getting into now what, what, what we found in our pilot study. You could see we had a, a, a large representation of sexual and gender minorities. Black African-American youth were well represented in our study. Um, and we, we tracked youth baseline three and six months. We conducted in-depth interviews with the youth and with the landlords that we worked with where we, where we were housing the youth. What did we find? So in the pilot study, um, we found that there was a 35% reduction in drug use. Our kids were primarily marijuana users. The reason this is significant is because one of the concerns that um, the field has around housing um, youth in unsupervised housing situations is that they will um, start using alcohol and drugs um, the crazy once they get into their into their housing situation. But that's not what we found. And so I believe that once stress goes down, once the, once the youth are away from other drug using peers and are focused on, on the future and have some hope, um, they're not using alcohol and drugs as much in order to cope. Um, we also found that um, reduced drug use consequences, support networks changed. So they actually became smaller. So the youth were disaffiliating with other street, um, street living peers and even family members who had alcohol and drug use. So their drug use network, their street, their social network became smaller, but became fewer drug using social network members. And their cognitive distortions um, were reduced. I assume that's also from the cognitive therapy that was offered to many of the youth because so many of them were suicidal. So they received that intervention, which focused also on cognitive distortions. So no youth began opioid use during the six months, that's good. And we had a lot of contact with the youth, 14 sessions. During the qualitative interviews with the youth to find out what they thought of the intervention, most youth reported positive changes from the intervention. They didn't have too many things that they didn't like. They, we didn't, they didn't say anything they didn't like. But I wanna bring up our last polling question now. What do you think youth identified as appreciating the most from the intervention that they received through our program? And the options are rental payments, because we paid their rent for six months, the service connections that they received, because we were linking them to, they identified their goals and what they wanted help with, and then we linked them to those things. Or was it the relationship with their advocate? Okay, so um, this actually surprised me the most from this um, qualitative uh, analysis, but youth identified the relationship with the advocate as, as many of you identified as the most um, valuable, important, and, and the, most, the thing that they liked the most from our intervention. Um, actually, the, they didn't even mention too, too, too much about the things that they got from the project, like the service connections, the housing. It was overwhelmingly about their relationship with the advocate, um, all 17 youth. The, the relationship with the advocate was primary. And, and, and this has been reported by other studies who do strengths-based work 
in that um, the relationship with the advocate who's linking them is someone who's on their side, who's serving as as uh, as a bridge between them and and the people who they haven't trusted. Um, so these kids are are really reforming um, connections to others um, through the advocate who who holds unconditional positive regard throughout the whole time with the youth. And for some youth, that's the first experience. For other youth, it's a rekindling of that experience. So I think this is the most powerful thing of anything. Uh, we could teach youth so many things. We could teach them how to cope. We could teach them how to fill out applications. But unless youth believe that what they do matters and that they'll be successful, and this is Albert Bandura talking, they're not gonna have the self-efficacy to follow through. So it's, it's the belief that what they do matters and that they can be successful, which is a focus of the advocate with the youth that leads them to be able to then approach situations and employ those skills that they have or have learned. Okay. We also interviewed the landlords. They liked the rental payments. They liked the opportunity to help others. This is how we got many of them engaged to work with us. They didn't like the six month lease so much. They preferred the 12 month lease. We did six months because we were only covering six months of rent and we didn't want to have any evictions for the youth based on them engaging with us in our project. They also didn't like problematic tenants, I guess would be expected. But I wanna tell you the lessons learned from this work. Well, I have mentioned the relationship with the advocate was most important. Um, their focus really shifted from basic needs to higher order needs as they got housed and as they continued their work with us. Although we did find that HIV session attendance, uh, what never got, it was always poor. We weren't really excited about that. Youth require different things from advocates. Some of them need to meet a lot with the advocates, some of them not so much. Usually it was around two to three times a week for the first couple months, and then it was two to three times a month after that. We often find youth don't show up for appointments or miss appointments, and, and that's that's something that has to be dealt with in supervision when working with advocates and others who work with the youth so that they don't get frustrated. It's it's the lives of the youth. It's it's the chaos. It's not it's not meant to be disrespectful. Um with the housing itself, we use scattered site housing. And so we were approaching landlords in, in the community to work with us. And many of our kids, of course, they had poor, no credit, no ID. They had criminal records, prior evictions, and unpaid utility bills. Other issues that we had to contend with is, um, well, the rental prices went crazy. And besides that, but we also had not a lot of rental options. So, you know, those are systemic to the nation, but safety concerns too, for what we could afford um, and the, um, the state of affairs in the apartments that we could afford wasn't always great. We had Nationwide Children's Hospital um, pay the landlords directly for the rental payments. So one thing that was making Nationwide nervous is that when the landlords would get ups uh, upset with a tenant, um, Nationwide was worried that they would sue Nationwide. So this is also something that um, folks who don't typically do housing interventions like universities or other research institutes probably would maybe want to know about before they get started. Um, also, the kids, they really needed help dealing with the landlords. Um, and, and we often had to intervene um, on behalf of the youth with the landlord. Advocates, they often became frustrated with the landlords. The landlords, not, they didn't always treat the youth well. The advocates often dealt with secondary trauma and racism. Advocates were not, they were always on call, except for when they, they would tell the youth, you know, they're going to bed at you know, a certain time. So they'll tell the youth, you know, from nine to, to eight, you know, I'm, I'm asleep if you have an emergency, call 911. Um, I mean, but most of the time, um, the advocates are, are responding to texts and calls um, for various things that come up during the day. You know, the kids can change quickly, and this reinforces the work that the advocates are doing, so that's a positive. 
but it also we experienced a lot of burnout and turnover with advocates. Not all advocates have the temperament or skills for, for this kind of work. So these are lessons learned. So in summary, even though these kids are at high risk for opioid use disorder and overdose death, um, that you know they can be engaged in multiple sessions. Advocates are essential. Um, housing alone is is not sufficient. We need to do we need to add service linkage and and engage youth in in needed services in addition to just housing. For the future, so many of our youth have been in foster care or justice involved. If we could uh, improve that transition planning so these youth don't hit the streets. We could sure do a lot of, of good prevention of, of suicide, drug use, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We, we, I think feel like we need to figure this out. I believe we need greater funding allocations, drop-in centers, since so many of the youth aren't going to shelters or other services. So um, housing first, I, I, I think we're making an empirical case the housing first and not fourth makes sense. If housing is such a powerful um, prevention tool, maybe this should be a standard operating tool for, for prevention. Um, other issues that came up for the future that we need to address, getting these kids housed when they have no identification and then during COVID, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles shut down. We had a really good, that was a real challenge because we couldn't get our kids' IDs. Um, you know, the, the the records that they had, we had to ask landlords to house them even when they had records when they don't normally do that. Um, and getting those utility bills paid, that that was that was a struggle because some of them had thousands of dollars. And well, at least in Ohio, they'll take payments, many of the, many of the times they required like a large down payment, which which was really difficult. And with that, that's the end of my my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. It was a wonderful presentation and the work is so important and I appreciate you know, your ability to bring both sides of the story. There's kind of the research side of, you know, what you all are finding, but there's also just the practical implementation side that, um, has our audience Q&A <laughs> lit up. So we're gonna dive in and do kind of a mishmash of questions um, based on the stuff you've covered and questions we have the YGI and also the questions that our uh, audience is uh, queuing up to ask. Um, so- Should I stop sharing my screen? Yes, please. That would be great. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so I just wanna start and you talked a little bit about a kind of the traditional paradigm and you walked us through this idea of, you know, you get services and a young person stabilizes um, and then they get, they get housing. Um, so can you talk us through kind of what's the trajectory for the housing first paradigm? So if a young person is going to get um, housing and then while they're receiving that, kind of what is the trajectory expected for that young person and their experiences and how they'll fare in the program and what will happen to them after? Oh, yeah. Well, there's there's a lot of diversity in response to Housing First so uh, and to the kind that we did. So ours was um, rapid rehousing, so it was temporary. It wasn't permanent supportive housing. So permanent supportive housing, you provide the vouchers for the long term, like could be permanently, that's the idea. Whereas with youth, I don't think for the youth that we serve, many of them, and I know this from the project that we're working on now, 75% um, have maintained their apartments or housing situations after rental supports ended. So once they get in their apartments, we're able to work with them to find um, 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 fin financial supports and through either entitlements or through employment, or through grants so they can go to school in order to maintain their apartments. Um, some of them need more than six months. So it's not a one size fits all. Now we're doing our study so we can sort of identify some of the predictors of who succeeded and who didn't. So I think we're still learning what, you know, what is needed for each 
individual and how to predict that. But for the most part, many of the youth that we work with, 18 to 24, a lot of them um, just needed some of the, the supports, the, the, almost the life skill supports to get set up, the, the coaching through employment, and they do well. Many of them got get back into school um, and get jobs and and with the support that they didn't have growing up, they're they're able to do well. Oh, thank you. And so um, I think one of the supports that you talked about and the young people seemed very impacted by were the advocates and the folks who were playing that role in their life. And so that has become a key focus of some of the questions in the Q&A. So if we can spend a few minutes um, and I'll ask you some questions about the advocate. Um, so does the advocate act as a mentor for you? They're more of a case manager. And how does that matching work? Is it by cultural background, gender, sexuality, or what are the other factors that may be considered? So the advocates, um, the advocates uh, represent the youth in terms of racial background, sexual minority status, and even prior experiences of homelessness and drug use, uh, but not. But I don't. I don't purposely link the youth with with someone who's just like them. Just there, there's a range of advocates and a range of youth, and I haven't had to. I haven't seen that there has been an issue with linking a youth to someone who's had the exact same experiences as them, um, and. But in terms, of, what was the first part of that question? Um, does the advocate act more as a mentor or a case manager? They act more, I would say, as we 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 describe it as an ally who's on the side of the youth. I I like to think of them more as therapeutic case managers. So they're somewhere between a broker and a therapist, but they don't have to be a therapist. So they're they're co coaching the youth like practicing job interviews, um, helping the youth role play how to deal with their em employment supervisor. Some of the youth um, get angry really quickly when they're like not, when they perceive an injustice and in how they've been talked to by a supervisor and they lose jobs like that really, it's a theme. They, they quit, they yell and they get fired. So it's, it's helping the youth take helping the youth role play these kinds of situations, talking with landlords, same thing, supervisors. So I say that they're therapeutic case managers who behave like a broker, but an ally and that's why we call them the advocates. And so you said they don't have to be therapists, uh, but following up on one of the uh, questions from the audience, are there certain types of professional experiences that are helpful? individual characteristics. I know you mentioned that some folks don't necessarily have the temperament um, to be an advocate. So I'm just curious if what you saw as the key ingredients for success in that role. I get asked that question a lot. So I've been working with, I've been using this model of an advocate, um, one person who helps the youth traverse the system because trying to develop multiple relationships with all these different people is really hard for kids and youth. Um, and so having one person to help them with that I think just works well for the kids. Now, in terms of of predictors of who's who's best uh, at the job, so, um, uh, all preconceived ideas I would have ever had um, have always just gone out the window. So there have been people I, I thought wouldn't work out, maybe because they've had no experiences related or they were older. Like I remember when I started doing this, I was around maybe 30 years old. So I, I really fit in well with the kids. I hung out with them and it was like super easy. And I worried that like a 60 year old wouldn't be able to relate with them, but I still hired um, people who were older and the kids loved them. And so any any idea, or, or if I hired someone who was from the suburbs who really wanted to work with the kids, I was thinking, I ain't, you know, I don't know how this is going to work, but a lot of times they work out and then the opposite happens. So kids, people I hire who have histories uh, of living on the streets, you know, they can be really harsh on the kids and be even even um, unforgiving for the kids who, who don't follow through and things like that. So I haven't noticed a pattern. I think it's a more 
and this is not empirically based. This is my opinion. I believe what, what makes a successful advocate is someone who deeply cares about the youth, who has compassion, to take their perspective, um, who can maintain unconditional positive regard, which is the belief that that youth can succeed and get what they want out of life, even though that youth doesn't believe that to be the case. Um, as long as they hold this perspective and they have a passion um, for working with youth, this is now what I look like as the key ingredients. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well said. Um, so thinking about the advocates and you mentioned the high turnover rates, um, are there um, things that you recommend programs do to lower the turnover rates? Because um, we know the person who asked this question pointed out that turnover can also negatively affect young people um, who are yeah. receiving supports. So I said, so the turnover rates we had were due to the COVID. I should have clarified. That was the highest I'd had in this project ever because um, I, I needed people to work with the youth in person. And this was during the, the pandemic and people, um, people quit. So I was able to get the youth, the youth, the, the um, advocates working on my project, their COVID vaccines early as healthcare providers um, with the idea being that they would work with the youth because the youth needed in per you can't do this work on the phone um, you have to go you have I believe you have to meet with the youth and take them to where they need to go and show them the apartments and get them to the the doctor when they need to go and, and things like this um, but um, through COVID, uh, people were afraid to work in person. So I lost people. Um, in the past, when I lose people, it's usually right away. So it's when they start the job and they realize um, this job is not for me. Um, I don't usually lose people after like the initial three month period. If, if, if advocates get through the first three months, at least for my, from my experience, they stay with me for the, stay with me. They work on my projects for the long term. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Um, so now I want to ask, shift a little bit and ask about, um, you know, the discussion you had about the extreme overrepresentation of LGBTQIA plus youth who are um, among the homeless population. And so I'm wondering if there's anything in particular that you recommend programs do um, to meet the unique needs of this population, especially in thinking about identifying safe housing options. Yeah, the, okay, so one of the thing, the experiences of um, sexual and gender minority youth, at least here in Columbus, is that they also experienced a lot of um, a lot of prejudice and um, and and hate crimes. We have a lot of transgender youth as well who experience a lot of of hate and and then get depressed and a lot of more suicidal behaviors. So. Um, how, ensuring that the environment, like in a drop-in center, if they're coming to a drop-in center, is safe, and that the staff disallow any any hate talk and prejudice in the drop-in center. We we have in our drop center the prejudice-free zone, and we enforce it so that everyone feels safe. Um, you, you're not you're always looking on your over your shoulder when you're living on the streets. No, nobody's nobody feels safe on the streets. Uh, but they should have some place where they can feel safe. So I think that's really important in terms of housing. So if you're talking about congregate housing, um, like where youth um, live together, um, there are few program. There are some programs, at least in Columbus, there's a place called Kaleidoscope that's testing um, housing specifically um, for uh, uh, sexual and gender minority youth that they serve. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, benefits to that because then they have a support network um, all around. Um, but then also we want our youth to be integrated with the mainstream. We don't want them to have to all be um, housed together in one place, mm -hmm. which was also Samson Barris's um, vision that we want, we don't want people experiencing homelessness to be isolated and blocked off altogether in one building. We want them part of our community, yeah. integrated. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. 
Um, so one person just wanted to clarify the age of young people who were involved in the study, and I think you said 18 to 24. Yeah. Um, and then a follow-up question to that is, do you think that, you know, this specific kind of transitional age developmental stage makes youth needs different than other groups um, or other members of the general homeless population, people who are homeless? Absolutely, because youth are still developing their identity and who they are. And then also the youth that we serve, most of them have reported being on the streets for the first time when they were 15 years old. Um, and this means that the youth didn't get the, tr the traditional supports in through, through life and developing romantic relationships and figuring out who they are, figuring out how to get through school. Most, none of our kids are, are still in school. You know, once you hit the streets, you, you just pretty much are focused on survival. So these kids do need um, more supports on um, life skills, on just learning the ways of, of how to negotiate with our social group or our systems or institutions that that adults who who experience homelessness maybe later they they've already got that foundation that makes sense um in this particular study were you able to work with undocumented youth um in in columbus we work with like somalis but i'm not so we work with African youth who have been often, um, their parents came here and then they, there was conflict mm -hmm. and then the kids go to the streets, but not, I don't think we had undocumented youth from like Mexico or South America. Um, and so in asking a few more questions about the young people who participated, um, did you find that unhoused youth were engaging in kind of CSEC, commercial sexual exploitation um, of children, um, or were at risk or working with young people who were more at risk for CSEC behaviors? Um, can you, did we work with youth who were at risk for what? For commercial, commercial or survival sex or commercial oh, sex exploitation. All of our kids are at risk for... Um, or who are engaging or at risk or like... Yeah, um, our youth, our youth do engage in sex work and not all the time do they recognize that they're engaging in sex work because, because many of our youth, you know, there's, it's one thing to have a pimp and, and, you know, to be, um, um, on the streets and and on the corner, but it's another thing to to sleep in somebody's some older gross adult's house who's letting you sleep there um, with the idea that you're going to be having sex with them. That's also, you know, that's sex work. That's trading sex for a place to stay. The youth don't recognize that, but many of our youth are get in those situations. Mm -hmm. And were there any services that you all provided that were kind of directly related to that experience or was some of that covered in kind of the, the cognitive are therapy or? Are you talking about trauma experiences or, or the tra trauma experiences? Yes, trauma so, experiences related. Mm -hmm. So the advocacy intervention identifies the needs that the kids may have. And they may not identify post-traumatic stress disorder as one of those needs, but if the advocate does identify that, they may make that suggestion to the youth to see how the youth feels about a referral. The Star House actually does um, trauma therapy, um, it's an eye movement desensitization therapy and um, those kinds of things. So we do refer the youth to uh, trauma, you know, to, to those services. And so, the research, we're wondering, how does it translate for young people who are experiencing homeless who are under 18, um, especially the young people who are 16 or 17 and not interested in entering foster care? Um, do you have any kind of advice for that age population? Well, of course I do. <laughs> so, so I really wanted to do this project with, with youth 15 and older, because it's those youth, 15, 16, and seven, well, 14, especially the most youth 
um, experiencing homelessness that are under 18 are between the ages of 16 and 17. It's like 90%, but we do have also a large group of, of younger youth, but at least the 15, 16, 17 year olds, they won't, that won't go to the shelters that are hiding from foster care. These are the ones that are most at risk of sex work, of, of getting killed, of dying, of overdose. And those are the group I think we should really be focusing focusing on. Uh, this was actually going to be part of my, my, um, my statement at the end, but I'm gonna make it now. Um, youth, those minor youth have it even harder than the youth who are 18 years and older. Um, because they're avoiding um, family and foster care, and I have so many stories and examples of this. Um, you know, these kids are are dying. They're they're at risk for 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 the worst outcome of all. Um, Drop-in centers. They're afraid of serving these youth because laws don't support um, programs serving these youth because of um, uh, threats of interference with custody or contributing delinquency of a minor. And so then you see programs not wanting to serve minor youth on the streets uh, and saying that they only serve adult youth. Um, emancipation is not a viable option for, at least in Ohio, for the youth that we serve because the, 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 it's so restrictive what you have to achieve in order to be emancipated, which means you can't contract. So, uh, so not only are youth, are people trying not to allow youth to be served by drop-in centers, which is what I think is a lifeline to get youth connected to health services, uh, mental health services, food, um, away from predators. <laughs> but then, um, you know, they can't, they can't get their IDs because they don't want their parents who holds their birth certificate. <laughs> or, you know, you can't get an ID without a, a guardian signature oftentimes either. Um, we need, we need to be able to do that. Because if you don't have your ID, you can't work legitimately so they have to steal and, and then that's how they also get engaged i could go on and on this just gets me really hot <laughs> yeah i mean i think that means there'll be a part two one day natasha <laughs> well they can sign a lease right the kids can sign a lease but it won't be upheld in court and you got to get the landlord to agree to let them sign the lease uh or and to let them sign a lease without id so i think our system is just it's really uh Maybe a hundred years from now it will be different, but I've I've tried to actually change the laws in Ohio, uh, and it was I couldn't. It was impossible. I worked with the Attorney General's office. We got people together, but um, mm -hmm. I give up. Well, that's. I mean, it's the realness. We we need all the pieces to work together in order to make effective change. And so if we can't all get everything that the young people need, then how do we do it? So I think that makes total sense. And I think it's a good segue into um, a couple of questions. I think people are thinking now about implementation and you've got those wheels turning here among the audience. Um, and so, and someone in the audience says, never give up, you're so needed. Um, <laughs> thank you, Maria. Um, so I think there's two questions, how can we, do you have thoughts or recommendations on pushing for legislative change for kids for 14 to 17? Um, less concerns or word of advice you would give based on your work to in that area. Um, but then also for people who are interested in kind of implementing something like this, um, do you have a sense of when a model would be ready um, based on kind of your research and um, or what's already out there that they could use to build off of? Um. So um, as far as I know, this is the first randomized trial with non-parenting youth experiencing homelessness. Um, um, the evidence base for housing first um, for adults is, is increasing, but youth have not, there has not been a huge focus on youth. Um, so we don't have a lot of research out there um, I, I, I do think it does need to be modified from the adults um, housing first. There was that um, one large housing first trial, I believe it was in Canada. Um, and they did look at the youth subsample of those adults in the housing first trial. And they found that it, 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 um, the youth did well, uh, but they, they did behave differently than the older adults. Uh, I think they had 
gosh, I don't want to say it wrong. I thought they had less employment than the older adults. I don't know what the, the supportive services were um, for them. Uh, and it wasn't just specifically targeted towards youth and it wasn't a randomized trial just for youth. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what, when, I don't know when these, this will be um, um, up, uh, taken up by communities. I think one barrier to housing first and supportive services is, is the, is the funding uh, for youth specifically. I think most of the funding goes to runaway shelters um, the runaway and homeless youth that put most of the money into the runaway shelters. Only a tiny little bit goes to street outreach, tiny little bit. And and um, I, I don't know. I think that we need to figure out how to get more resources. Of course, that's always the rub, isn't it? It's always the resources. It is always the resources. Um, but speaking of resources, we've had a couple questions that I want to make sure that we get to before we close. Um, so people are asking about assessment tools. Um, and so you had mentioned that there was a prevention evaluation tool and organization that was developed in New York City. Um, if you could say the name of that again, and it, then folks yeah, are interested. The housing first that Samson Barris, Pathways to Housing. Path, ha pathways to Housing. Okay. Pathways to Housing. Okay, awesome. And then do you have any recommendations for assessment tools that programs can be using? For assessment of what? Of what specifically? That's a good question. Um, we, use, okay, we use a range yeah, of maybe. assessments. So, and, and ours are, you know, a research assessment is probably different than a clinical assessment. Yeah, so our I'm research, using clinical assessment. Yeah, so, you know, we use, I mean, the Beck Depression Inventory, the hopelessness inventory we use that we use those. I think many programs use those. Um, we use, but see, we're we're assessing um, drug use, drug use consequences. We we assess. Um, um, we developed our own assessment of experiences while living on the streets, um, and and that covers like that's a huge that's something we developed because there wasn't really anything out there when we started doing this work which was in 1998. So we assess um, just so many experiences youth have living on the streets. That also self-efficacy, we assess self-regulation, we, we assess um, anxiety, coping, we assess everything. We have a lot of assessments. If anyone's interested, you could just reach out to me and I could share our assessment tools with you. Excellent. Thank you so much. That's so generous. Um, all right. So I can't, I, this is where I get into trouble, Natasha, because I just want to do one last question. So one last question. Um, thoughts on kind of looking longitudinally um, at how young people do after this. Has anybody done any type of longitudinal um, study? Or are you all planning to kind of follow the young people you're working with longer term? Um, so we, we only track the youth in this study for a year. Um, we have another study that we're going to be tracking them for two years. I think I've read only one study that tracked youth for four years. I think it was a smallish sample. So it hasn't been done in the, it hasn't, there's not been a lot. There are those, those huge, like ad health data, you know, all of those huge data sets that have a small, tiny number of, of youth that either ran away or were homeless. I know people use those to look, to look over the lifetime. Thank you, Natasha, so much. I want to thank you on behalf of the YGI and the audience in attendance today. Um, they have really appreciated um, your presentation. I can tell by the comments and also uh, based on all the Q&A. Um, and so we wanted to give you one last parting um, word opportunity um, before I start to wrap this up for the day. All right, well, I'll keep it brief because I was going to talk about the, the minor youth, but now that I've already done that, I, I guess I would just say it's really not true that that these kids who are living on the streets and in, in the woods, under bridges and abandoned buildings don't want to be engaged. But we have to go out and find them and engage them. It means coming out of our offices and doing things differently than maybe we were used to or that we feel comfortable doing. So I really feel that's essential. Well, thank you so much. I think that's a wonderful 
work to end on and also given the season just reminding us that we have to we have to go out we have to be proactive um, we can't wait and expect the young people to come to us um, so thank you so much natasha um, thank everyone for attending uh, in a moment we will launch a poll question asking how much you agree or disagree with the statements the webinar was informative and the webinar was engaging please answer these questions um, so that we can know how today's webinar worked for you uh, da, 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 da. The next uh, YGI Lunch and Learn webinar session will be held on January 23rd at 12 p.m. Eastern Time with Dr. Renee Spencer of the School of Social Work at Boston University. Her presentation is titled Youth Initiated Mentoring, What It Is and How It Can Transform the Mentoring Process. Uh, immediately following this webinar, we will send a survey to you all via email. Please complete the survey as it allows you to provide further feedback and questions for us. This information is also used to improve future webinar sessions. The survey should take no longer than five minutes, and we will also put the link for the survey in the chat section now. Finally, if you haven't already done so, feel free to contact or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. The links to those accounts can be found on our website. And just a reminder that the views expressed here are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the New York State Youth Justice Institute. In closing, I want to thank you all for taking part in this session of the YGI Lunch and Learn series. We hope that you've gained something from this webinar and that you continue to think about what Dr. Slesnick has presented today. We look forward to seeing you at future YGI events.